Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. In a bid to boost private sector cooperation in the semiconductor sector, India and the United States have inked an initial pact which would facilitate business opportunities and develop an ecosystem to reduce their dependency on China and Taiwan. In fact, the U.S. imposed export controls to curb high-tech semiconductors being exported to China. Joining me now to discuss this further, I'm joined by Ajit Minocha, President and CEO of Semiconductor Equipment and Materials International, Paul Shah, Vice President and Director of Studies at Center for New American Security, and Jeffrey Bean, Program Manager of Tech Policy at ORF America. But before we go across to our guests, I caught up with Thea Rosman Kendler, the Assistant Secretary of Commerce at the Export Administration in the United States. Let's play out that exclusive interview for you. I'm so excited to be here. This is a great time, a promising time in the U.S.-India high technology relationship. We uh, look at strategic trade controls as the building blocks for all the innovation that we hope to accomplish with India. And so I'm here to talk about our common interests, our common security outlook, and how the United States and, and India can work together even more closely for secure trade, which leads to open and accessible trade. Right. I'd like to ask you about the U.S. export controls that were imposed with regard to high-end chips and high-end semiconductor technology reaching China. What is the larger aim of that? Because there is also a worry in the U.S. industry that it may uh, backfire on them as well. We imposed those controls last fall with a very clear national security picture in mind. We targeted only the most advanced chips because we did not want to unduly interfere with commercial trade. By targeting the most advanced chips that, that can be used in supercomputers, that can be used in artificial intelligence programs, we're targeting China's military modernization capabilities. Mm -hmm. We're also targeting their abuses of human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, when they uh, can build uh, supercomputers and data centers based on those supercomputers, uh, it enables their ability to track minority populations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of these activities are... Uh, contrary to U.S. national security and foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took decisive action uh, under the Biden-Harris administration to make sure that we are cutting off China's access, access to these technologies. Right. Uh, have you also seen countries like Russia circumventing those uh, export controls and sanctions when it comes to uh, high-end technology, including high-end semiconductors? Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we're watering very closely. We are concerned that uh, countries and companies are being taken advantage of as Russia builds illicit procurement networks to try to gain access to technologies that we and 38 other global economies have cut off from Russia and Belarus. We are... Um, you know, we, we see in the debris found on the battlefield in Ukraine that Russia is using components in its missiles, in its weaponry, its drones that are manufactured outside of Russia. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that they do not have the capacity to rebuild and repair their war machine. Mm -hmm. So we, we've looked very closely at um, any instance of backfill or uh, circumvention of our regulations through third countries, and we'll take appropriate uh, responsive action under U.S. law. Right. Uh, are you also seeing uh, some of those semiconductors reaching Russia via India in some form or the other? Uh, is, this a, is this a message? Is this a concern that you've raised with the Indian industry and the Indian government? We're working with partners all over the world to make sure that uh, this, this trade, that Russia is not using uh, their industry to, to facilitate this illegal trade. Right. But uh, specifically on India? That's not something I'm going to get into. Thanks. All right. Uh, to ask you about uh, the MOU, MOU on semiconductors that India and U.S. signed recently during the high-level visit of uh, Secretary Raimondo, what will be the next steps in terms of operationalizing the MOU? Uh, what could be India's role in that collaboration? I think the details of the MOU are still being worked out. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we are close partners with India on secure trade, and that enables uh, lots of different opportunity under the MOU. Right. Uh, what are the building blocks that you would like to lay down as far as export controls go to allow for easier collaboration, easier export 
of semiconductor technology from US to India? What are the building blocks that you would like to identify and put in place? Well, actually, as it stands now, we treat India, because it is a major defense partner, we treat India as if it were uh, akin to a NATO partner. Um, under export controls, we have very strong building blocks already in place with India. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to future collaboration as we identify emerging technologies to build those blocks together. Right. Uh, in terms of having a global acceptance for those export controls that U.S. is imposing, uh, is there a need for that? Is U.S. trying to have a multilateral acceptance with more countries on board with these uh, controls? We are always looking for a multilateral approach to export controls. Uh, one of my colleagues once described export unilateral controls as damming half the river. When there's foreign availability of technology, we must have multilateral cooperation with our partners to make sure that we are effective in the controls that we impose. Right. My, my final set of questions. Uh, what are the issues that you would like to put on the table uh, ahead of this dialogue when it comes to export controls to facilitate trade between the two countries in high-end technology? One thing that's come to, we've come to realize during our week in India is that we have some availability for smoother trade without license that doesn't seem to be fully taken advantage of by Indian companies. And so we'd like to uh, do more education and outreach to Indian companies and to their U.S. exporters to make sure they understand that there may be smoother ways, faster, more effective and efficient ways to receive trade from the United States that isn't being used right now. All right, so that was Thea Rosman Kendler, the Assistant Secretary for Export Administration, talking about export controls to stop high-end chips from going to China and Russia. Let's open this up for our viewers. Let me go across to uh, Paul, uh, who's on our panel right now. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, give us a sense of the larger aims of the U.S. export controls. We had the Assistant Secretary... Uh, Kendler explaining that U.S. wants to deter China from getting that high-end technology, those advanced chips, which can be used in AI, military weapons as well. But is the U.S. really successful in doing so? Well, we've seen that the U.S. and many countries are very deeply concerned about China's military buildup in the region. China has been threatening many surrounding countries, India, Taiwan, many others. And AI is an important enabler of Chinese military power. And so the U.S. controls are very targeted. They go after an estimated 1% of the chips that China is importing. But these most advanced chips are essential to control these to make sure that China is not leveraging this technology to improve its military and to threaten the region. Right. Uh, Mr. Manocha, what's your sense? Is this really helping the U.S. industry, harming the U.S. industry, and impacting the global supply chains? What could be the long-term impact of such export controls? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Luthra. The, in my opinion, uh, the, the concerns that the U.S. has raised about the national security, uh, I think uh, it's not, we are not there to second-guess second them. I fully agree with the, their concerns and the actions they are taken. Is it helping the U.S. industry? Uh, not yet. I mean, of course, uh, there's a major uh, export to the to these countries that we're talking about, and uh, but I think uh, things will uh, balance out uh, as a function of time. I, I look at it this way: the industry is growing through leaps and bounds. I mean, our industry was six hundred billion dollars uh, IC revenue last year, and it's going to go to one trillion dollar by 2030. So there's a need for growth of this industry. And uh, I see that USA-India co collaboration will really help to create a, another uh, hub for semiconductors. And there's a need for that. Right. Uh, Jeff, if I could bring you in on the specific aspect that the Assistant Secretary had spoken about, about how Russia is able to circumvent the U.S. export controls. They are being able to procure semiconductors, essential components necessary to make weapons from third countries. How is Russia doing that? How can the U.S. act against those companies, uh, those countries? Does it really have the wherewithal or would it need 
multilateral consensus to really implement these export controls successfully and take action uh, against countries which are supplying these semiconductors to Russia? Thanks, Richard. Uh, great question. I, I want to emphasize that with respect to smuggling these chips, some of them are extremely small, especially at the, the die size level. So uh, you have to have a really fine net if you were hoping to capture all of these ships uh, reaching uh, the battlefield in Russia. However, the point you make about multilateralizing these controls is a really important one. Uh, in the uh, imposition of the export controls that were announced in October of last year with respect to semiconductors, their focus, as uh, you and colleagues have pointed out, on advanced GPUs uh, at the data center level, on China's uh, capacity to focus on supercomputer development in the future, and of course, on China's ability to manufacture uh, advanced chips. And so for the United States to make an effective policy, the controls as they were announced were unilateral and extraterritorial. And it, the U.S. secured a key win earlier this year in its uh, ability to convince the Japanese and Dutch governments to jo join an agreement to limit semiconductor manufacturing equipment sales uh, to China, uh, to Russia and to uh, other uh, geopolitical competitors and, and bad actors. And so with this development to uh, allow the U.S. to prevent, uh, in conjunction with other global like-minded partners and allies, the sale of extreme ultraviolet lithography equipment, as well as the next step down uh, to deep ultraviolet lithography uh, immersion equipment to China and other actors. Uh, that's a clear win in terms of multilateralization. From my perspective, the next step will be, can the U.S. bring uh, other partners and allies uh, on board that are like-minded to secure the supply chain in the other areas of chips that they've identified with respect to the uh, export controls? That will be key. All right. Uh, we're going to take a short break at this point, but don't go anywhere. Our extensive discussion with Paul, Jeff Bean and Ajit Manocha continues on the other side. We'll be right back in a short while. Welcome back. You are watching Global Eye. We're discussing the geopolitics of semiconductors and what India and US can do together and what possibly Taiwan can do as well. We still have with us Ajit Manocha, President and CEO of Semiconductor Equipment and Materials, Paul Shaw, Vice President and Director of Studies at Center for New American Security, and Jeffrey Bean, Program Manager, Tech Policy at ORF America. Paul, if I could come with you, uh, do you see certain points where the CHIPS Act and the Semicon policy of India to promote semiconductor manufacturing can complement each other? Oh, absolutely. The U.S. and India both have a shared interest in growing India's role in the semiconductor industry at a number of places whether that's in fabrication, in making the chips, in design, in the advanced testing and packaging that comes to assemble the chips and put them together, and in the manufacturing of finished electronic devices. Where right now China dominates the market supply chain for uh, manufacturing these devices. And so a lot of electronics right now, they might be you know, chips that are designed in the US, they're made in Taiwan, and then they're assembled in China. And China has an outsized role in the supply chain. So we've seen over the last couple of years how much that's a risk, how much being dependent on a country where you don't trust them, you know, it's not clear if you have these vulnerabilities, how China might weaponize that. That's not in uh, any of our country's interests. So finding ways to work together to grow India's role in the semiconductor supply chain is vitally important. And it's certainly a priority for the United States. Right. Uh, but Jeff, is it really worthwhile? Because the entire urgency around semiconductors came with COVID-19 when we suddenly realized that uh, there was a surge in demand for electronics and we have fallen gravely short of semiconductors. But considering India does not have any ecosystem for semiconductors just yet, where can India complement United States plans for semiconductor manufacturing? And can India really play a big role in global manufacturing of semiconductors in the global value chain? Uh, thank you, Parish. Uh, I think from an outsider's perspective, uh, as an analyst, on the, the industry side, the challenge is that India faces competition from around the world. Everyone has a, a chips act, uh, it seems, in place, of course, Europe. Korea, the United States as well. But India does have some advantages, as Paul mentioned. 
uh, first off, it's in U.S. government interest to ensure that there is resiliency and redundancy among like-minded partners and allies in the supply chain. Uh, in addition to that, it's worth noting that India has a significant advantage with respect to design talent. Most of the major fabulous companies, that is, companies that design chips but don't manufacture them, have offices in, in India and Bangalore and other locations to facilitate and draw on the, the talent that exists with respect to chip design. It is true that if you're looking at the efforts of the India Semiconductor Mission in their effort to, to move India up the value chain, I think it's clear that the center and certain uh, states are very serious this time around about trying to draw a, advanced manufacturing capability for semiconductors into India. But there are challenges, and just globally, uh, around the world, as private sector firms are the ones that take these decisions, it's a highly capitally intensive industry with billions of dollars required to set up a fab uh, or a back-end facility. And these companies have to take hard decisions and look at, do you have stable electricity supplies? Is there access to clean water and redundancy in both of these areas? What does the taxation regime look like? What is the regulatory environment like? Are there clusters of universities training electrical engineers and material scientists, as well as other related companies? These things take a great deal of time to set up. So I think for, for India, the, the key is going to be to secure the first mover and, and try and establish one or two of these clusters. But it's a long process. It's a long process. Ajit Manocha, coming to you, uh, India and Un United States have signed a memorandum of understanding on semiconductors during Gina Raimondo's recent visit. Very little is known about how this will really work out. Uh, do we know the nitty-gritties of this MOU? Not really. Uh, we don't know the nitty-gritties, but I think the big picture is very clear. I think uh, my colleagues Paul and Jeffrey have articulated the role India can play and India should play. And I think SEMI brings uh, yet another dimension. SEMI is a 50-some years old uh, uh, India uh, trade association where we bring the ecosystem into the countries uh, who need to grow. And uh, we enable the ecosystem. And I think my recent discussions with the government of India, especially with the uh, Honorable Minister uh, Ashwini Vaishnav and uh, Rajiv Chandra Shekharji, uh, we have uh, outlined how SEMI can play a role to bring the ecosystem into India. Uh, like we have uh, various events uh, held by SEMI in uh, like minded countries uh, like Japan, uh, uh, South Korea, uh, Europe, uh, US, of course. And we are planning on bringing a similar kind of semicon conference into India in 24. And that will actually bring the entire ecosystem uh, for networking and for also supporting India's uh, new projects. Uh, as, uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, that we need to see the first or two, first one, a couple of new companies to come in. And we need to play a role to support them to make sure they are very successful uh, and uh, first time right. So I think that's the way, role where SEMI will play and will make this a success. Whatever the MOU contents are, well, I think we're gonna build upon that. And uh, I think the assistant secretary mm -hmm. said that the details are being worked out. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the coming weeks uh, will be involved in those uh, planning uh, discussions with the Department of Commerce and the Indian government. Right, uh, I would also like to ask you, since the Indian government announced the semicon policy, We've not seen too much really taking off the ground when it comes to actual work on the ground. Yes, a few companies have signed joint ventures, announced plans, but we've not really seen things uh, moving uh, as such as far as actual groundwork goes, Mr. Manocha. Do you think India needs to do more? Are investors right now a little wary, a little hesitant about the India semiconductor story, Mr. Manocha? Well, you know, I would say one thing that in the past there were some uh, from, uh, missed opportunities where India announced the fabs and didn't happen. But I think this policy, the, for the first time, I feel this policy is very well thought of. It underpins the, the various comments and inputs I've been giving, and uh, I think India has been receiving from other uh, semiconductor veterans as well. I, I, I'm very pleased with the progress that's going on under the India Semiconductor Mission. I am under NDA, so I cannot really reveal uh, any of the details, but the couple of uh, applicants which we are uh, in the final stages of reviewing, I think I am very pleased that the business plan looks very uh, convincing and compelling. 
And uh, again, the next question will be how to make it implemented. Of course, uh, before that, Government of India has to do its own due diligence to make sure that they qualify in uh, all other uh, uh, all other issues that they have, they have to deal with. Especially the recent news about uh, uh, some of the financial issues with some of the companies. So, but as far as business plan is concerned, I'm feeling very, very, very pleased with the with the with the what I've seen so far. And the next question will be execution plan or implementation plan. There will need a lot of uh, involvement of the government of India to make sure that we can bring the right kind of uh, support from outside you uh, outside India to make it a success. Hmm. Right, uh, Paul. Coming back to you, uh, Taiwan. I think a question that Taiwan is asking: What will be Taiwan's role when it comes to U.S. global alliances on semiconductors, including the alliance with India, for that matter? Uh, do you think? From your conversations, your understanding of the U.S. government, do they have a role for Taiwan? Will Taiwan have a role to play between U.S. and India when it comes to that MOU? Well, Taiwan, I think, is under any scenario going to continue to be the leading hub of semiconductor manufacturing, particularly for the most leading edge chips. And that's not going to change. The lead that TSMC has over other companies is remarkable. Um, really, other than Samsung in Korea, there's really no other country, uh, companies that are competing up at the leading edge. And so I don't think that's going to change. We've begun to see TSMC look to diversify some of its manufacturing. They're placing um, a close to leading edge fab in the United States. So that's, I think, an important consideration. And they are playing a very active role, both the company and the Taiwanese government, in working with other countries United States, uh, Japan, the Netherlands, others, including uh, there's a lot of opportunity for them to work with India as we think about diversifying supply chains, creating more resiliency. But I don't think there's any scenario in which Taiwan doesn't continue to be a really important focal point for leading edge semiconductor manufacturing in the future. Right. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, we've run out of time, but very briefly, can Taiwan play a role in helping India skill its workforce when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing. Yeah, I, I agree with Paul. There's not going to be a scenario where Taiwan isn't uh, at the forefront of the semiconductor ecosystem. With respect to the, the plans that India has put forward, I think there is a potential role for collaboration and, and training. Of course, uh, my understanding is of the bids that have been publicly discussed, uh, Vedanta, uh, Foxconn, of course, Foxconn is a is a Taiwanese uh, and Chinese company, uh, but doesn't have a great deal of semiconductor in, uh, expertise. So the challenge will be, I think, for all of these bids, can they attract a leading uh, semiconductor uh, firm that has real expertise and know-how in uh, manufacturing? On the training side, I think there are opportunities for collaboration uh, between the uh, between TechGrow and other entities within India uh, on Taiwan. And of course, Taiwan has all the things that we just discussed in terms of clustering effect, in terms of science parks and the, the know-how, uh, the infrastructure in place. So that expertise is something that I think the government is willing to share with like-minded uh, partners and allies. All right. Uh, we run out of time, but uh, Jeffrey Bean, Paul Shah, and Ajit Manocha, thank you very much for joining us here on Globalize, giving us your view on India-U.S. Uh, collaboration on semiconductors and uh, U.S. attempts to form uh, alliances on chips to really have strong supply chains. That's all we have time for on Globalize. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.